Okay, gang, um, welcome to another lecture, and uh, I am about to present on muscle fibers. I am going to start from the beginning because um, I'm going to let you guys do this lecture entirely on your own. When I start class on Monday the 11th, I will be moving on to bioenergetics and ATP. So uh, I'm just going to reiterate, you are completely on your own with this lecture. So I'm going to start from the beginning and make sure that we understand everything. And uh, again, let's hope my pen works and it's not going to be too much of a problem. Let me just double check. Okay, we have some drawings. Okay, so we are going to reiterate muscle fi uh, fibers and talk about uh, some of the characteristics of those fibers. We already started to do it in class, so m much of this will be a uh, refresher, but let's get moving. So we had talked about in class how muscle fibers can be um, divided up into three different classifications. And again, we know the muscle fiber is what is innervated by the neuron. So if I had, let's just refresh our memories here, if I had one fascicle, we know that inside that fascicle are multiple muscle fibers. And if I pulled one of those muscle fibers out, and I went like this, and I went like this, we know that the neuron, or the motor unit, is going to innervate the muscle fibers right in the center. So this is where contraction happens. And we know that uh, that motor neuron is going to secrete something called ACH or acetylcholine. All this stuff is going to happen and ultimately the myofibrils, which are inside of the muscle fiber, are going to contract. We know those Z lines are going to get closer to one another and they're going to create tension. So. If you look at this slide, it tells us that some of the some of the details surrounding these characteristics are neurostimulation. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the neurons, just like the muscle fibers are different, the neurons that innervate those muscle fibers are different. So some of those neurons will say, hey, contract slow. Some of those neurons will say, hey, contract with much strength. And then some of those neurons will say, hey, fibers, contract which, with much power, right? And we know that those are three different contraction types. So the neurostimulation is one of the factors that is going to give skeletal muscle fibers its unique properties. Um, metabolic characteristics, well, we know that muscle fibers are going to use different fuels. Some of them are going to love fat. Some of them are going to love sugar or we can say glucose, right? Because glucose and sugar are the same thing. And some of them like this thing called ATP uh, that is readily available in the muscle. And we started talking about this ATP is this, is this energy, right? Now, um, when I say some muscle fibers like fat and sugar, well, ultimately, that fat and sugar will be converted to ATP. Skeletal muscle can't use fat by itself. It can't use sugar by itself. Fat and sugar, or glucose, must be converted to ATP. Um, so, and then that, ener that energy will make muscles, M-U-S-C-L-E, contract, okay? Um, so also we have speed of movement and that's what I just showed you up here. So the neuron will determine how quickly a muscle fiber can contract. Okay, again, are we going to have a slow contraction? Are we going to have a forceful contraction? Or are we going to have a quick, powerful contraction? Um, and then the color of these muscle fibers are also different. And those colors are different based upon how much myoglobin a muscle fiber has. And we talked a little bit about myoglobin in class, and I'll reiterate what myoglobin is in this class. So basically, I want you to just leave this slide knowing that we have three different types of... Sorry, when I multitask, my brain forgets how to spell. Three different types of muscle fibers, okay? 
no fiber is created equally. And if you look at this picture here, here we have a fascicle. Let me just beat a dead horse. Here we have a fascicle, right? And here we have a muscle fiber. And we know from all the exams that we have taken and all the quizzes that we have taken that um, the, the neuron stimulates the muscle fiber. Okay, and we know that, oh, that was not the fascicle, sorry, the muscle fiber. There we go. Ignore that. Okay, so we know the neuron is going to secrete acetylcholine right here, and then we are going to get muscle contraction. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So I drew a box here just to kind of show you <clears throat> how these muscle fibers look, and let's, re let's refresh our memory. If I look at, uh, let's go green, if I look at this connective tissue right here, well, we know we're looking at a muscle fascicle, and you should know what type of tissue surrounds the fascicle. It's not the endo, it's the peri, right? So here you can see the perimesium all in this area here, <clears throat> and inside of Let's go right here, okay? And inside of the perimesium, we start to see these muscle fibers. And I'm just kind of circling some of them for you, right? Um, you can see a fiber here, a fiber here, a fiber here, a fiber here. And ultimately, these fibers are all composed um, of different characteristics. So as I said, we could have type 1 fibers, type 2 fibers, and type 2X fibers. And those are the three fibers we're going to talk about. So I have type 1, okay, type 2A, and type 2X. When we're talking about type 1 fibers, these are our slow <clears throat> contracting fibers. They are what we use for when we walk or when we run. Uh, when I talk about these type 2A fibers, these are strength fibers, and these are what we use when we strength train. And then when I talk about type 2X fibers, these fibers are what we use when we sprint. They're powerful fibers. They, they cr produce a lot of force. And as I mentioned in class, um, we have different fiber compositions. So if I were to do a muscle biopsy on, let's say, uh, Sally Smith in class, and I looked at what her fiber composition was. I might see that Sally has a lot of that. You can't see that. Let me get a different color. Let's see if black shows up. I might see that she has a lot of type 1 fibers. Okay, and so we'll just say that she has all of these type 1 fibers. Let's say she has a couple of 2s over here, but there's another 1, there's a 2, there's a 2, right? Uh, there's a 2A, there's a 2X, but then we have lots of 1s. Well, if we were looking at Sally Smith's fibers and we saw that she had mostly type 1 fibers, well, then that would be her phenotype, or that would just be genetically what she's predispositioned with, which means Sally would be a wonderful aerobic athlete because she has a lot of type 1 fibers. They have a lot of mitochondria. It's, they're really, really good for aerobic activity, such as running. So Sally might naturally be a wonderful runner, long distance runner or cross country runner. So now let's say I did another muscle biopsy and let's say we're looking over here and we're looking at these muscle fibers, and let's say that this is uh, Billy Smith. This is um, this is Billy, and Billy happens to have a lot of 2A fibers, right? We did a biopsy, and we're like, wow, Billy seems to have a tremendous amount of 2A and very little type 1, so 2A, 2A, to a well that would mean that Billy is predisposed to being a natural strength athlete so because he has this phenotype of of type 2a fibers he's going to be really good at strength training he might just be naturally strong and some of you probably all have those friends that really don't have to work out much and are really good at 
some specific type of task because of their muscle composition. So when we're talking about these type 1 muscle fibers, these fibers, they have fewer uh, motor units. And I'll show you motor units on the next slide. We've talked about that in depth. We talked about it in class. Um, so that means they have kind of less. Oh, that's, let me change my color here. Let's go to green. They have less innervation, um, which just means that those type 1 fibers, they don't need as much neural control. They don't need a lot of refined movement. They don't need a lot of really specific twitch characteristics that are required for some sports like rugby, right? So if you think of, or, or lacrosse, you think of someone that's just a long distance runner, well, it's continuous exercise for a long distance, long period of time, and it's just in a straight line, right? So we don't need a lot of fine control for that type of movement. Or if you're walking a lot, you're walking throughout the day uh, at the university, you don't need a lot of refined movement. You're just walking in a straight line and the muscle recruitment doesn't need a lot of guidance from the brain or from the neuron, right? So these are usually smaller in diameter as well. So if you look over here, you can see that this guy is slightly smaller. This is slightly smaller. This is slightly smaller. Um, this one right here is really big, so that's not going to be a type 1 fiber. This here is a type 1 fiber. I could just tell by the diameter. Um, this here is a type 1 fiber. And remember how I told you that these things also have a different color, right? So if we go back to that first slide, I told you that color is another property that makes these fibers different. And you can see these type 1 fibers are slightly darker than their neighbors. You see how light that one is, and you see how light that one is, and you see how light that one is. Well, it's because of the myoglobin inside of these muscle fibers that make them darker. So just by looking at this picture, we can identify that these dark fibers are kind of popping out all over the place here compared to something like this. They're just lighter in color and they're smaller in diameter. And I said here they have a high capacity for oxygen, okay, because these fibers have much more mitochondria. And the mitochondria, as I told you several times now, it takes oxygen and it takes fat. And oxygen and fat go inside of the mitochondria and the mitochondria makes a lot of ATP. And that ATP is what we use while we're running. And as ATP starts to dissipate, if we can't make ATP while we're exercising, well then what happens to exercise is it starts to go down, right? So intensity goes down and duration goes down. So we can't exercise for a long period of time and we can't exercise at a high intensity when we don't have this energy over here being made by the mitochondria uh, because it's being depleted. So as I said, metabolism is different in type 1 fibers. These me metabolism likes fatty acids. It also can use sugar, but it, pre it prefers fat. So I would say that if we're just going to generically say, well, what type of fuel does type 1 fibers need to make ATP, I would say it likes 70% fat and 30% glucose. And if you remember what glucose is, it's sugar, right? Or it's a carbohydrate. These are all similar terms when we're talking about exercise science. Um, these are, uh, as I said, they have a lot of myoglobin, and that's what gives them this darker red color right here. Um, I'll show you what myoglobin is in more detail on the next slide. These are slower contracting muscle fibers, and that makes sense because they have fewer motor units, right? They don't have a lot of innervation, so they contract a little slower. And they have a lot of ATPase, which I'll explain on the next slide what that is. Um, and they also have lower intramuscular stores of ATP and phosphocreatine. Now, ATP and phosphocreatine are readily available in the muscle cell. Um, they are immediate energy that we can use. Let's say you are walking down the street 
and you're minding your own business and a, a ferocious dog jumps out in front of you, starts to bark, and then starts to advance towards you. Now your first, uh, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is sprint away. And if you go to sprint, well, it's going to take a long time before you can get that sugar and that fat to the muscles so that you can sprint away. So what the muscles do is they hold uh, inside of, uh, say, swimming pools. Let's say you have a, um, let's say, remember you guys when you were kids and your parents bought you one of those plastic little swimming pools, right? And they filled it with water and you would sit in the backyard and just kind of swim in that plastic little swimming pool. Um, so imagine that inside of your muscles, oops, that, that's not showing up. Imagine that inside of your muscles, you have this little swimming pool of stored energy. Energy that you can use immediately when needed. Well, inside of that swimming pool, you have ATP already stored and ready to go. So if that dog barks, you can sprint and run away. And while you're running away, those other energy systems, such as glucose and fat, can start being mobilized and get to the skeletal muscle. So when I talk about this intramuscular, that just means inside the muscle, ATP and phosphocreatine. Phosphocreatine we'll talk about uh, when we get into bioenergetics. Right now, I just want you to focus on ATP. I'm just saying that all of you have these little swimming pools of energy readily available for you to use for emergencies uh, right now. And you get about 20 to 30 seconds of energy from that uh, energy that is in the muscle. And once that energy is depleted, then we have to start bringing in other nutrients such as sugar or glucose or carbohydrates. They're all the same thing and fat to help you continue to run and to get away from that dog. So this is what I want to show you, show you with the motor units. So I have three type one muscle fibers here. Okay. And when we talk about a motor unit, we're talking about one neuron communicating with several fibers. That's a motor unit. And I, I drew this in class. I'm just going to do it again, right? We have our peripheral motor neuron. So I'm going to say PNS, right? Peripheral nervous system coming from the central nervous system. Let's just, let's just beat a dead horse here, right? We have our brain. We have our central nervous system, right? Here's, here's the brain, central nervous system. I'll just put CNS. And then we have these peripheral neurons coming from the central nervous system. And we're going to talk about a motor neuron, which you should know what that is now. Coming from the central nervous system. And this one neuron is going to, in this case, stimulate three motor, uh, three muscle fibers. I'm going to switch it to, oh, let's switch it to, let's switch it to red. So what's going to happen is this one neuron, this is one neuron, is going to stimulate three type one fibers. Okay, I'm just going to draw these And what this means is that this single neuron, I'm just drawing one, right? It has three axon terminals, right? Or axon bulbs. And you can see here, we have one, two, three. So when this single neuron fires in type one skeletal muscle, it controls fewer muscle fibers, all right? In this case, one neuron is only controlling three fibers. And we know at this axon terminal, it's going to secrete acetylcholine, acetylcholine, right? And then these fibers are going to contract. So this motor unit in this particular case is one neuron, I'm gonna say one N and three 
muscle fibers. So type 1 muscle fibers because they don't need a lot of acuity, right? They don't need a lot of precision. They don't need a lot of refined movement. These have only one neuron innervating fewer fibers. And when we get to type 2 and A and type 2 X fibers, you're going to see it's very different. The neurons control more fibers. Um, so this is just an example of what a motor unit is. So if I, if I said, if I give you a picture, I said, what type of motor unit is this? You would say it's one neuron and three fibers, right? And you, you could even go a little deeper because we, we talked about this in class. There's also three neuromuscular junctions, right? Because we know a neuromuscular junction is where the neuron innervates the muscle, right? Neuro, neuron, muscular, muscle fiber, junction. And a junction is just a place where two things meet, right? So in this particular picture, I have one neuron, three fibers, three neuromuscular junctions, and this is one motor unit. All right, let's move on. Um, so just to kind of talk about that myoglobin again, if you can see here, I have a muscle flexing. And you guys have probably heard of hemoglobin before, right? Hemoglobin is a protein inside of your blood. Uh, you can see the blood vessel right here. And you can see that hemoglobin binds oxygen. So there's four oxygen molecules on this protein. So essentially when you breathe oxygen in, like you are now, and that oxygen goes into your lungs, well, you have lots of uh, vascularity or you have lots of uh, capillaries and veins uh, in your lungs. And as that blood moves through your lungs, the oxygen is going to bind to something called hemoglobin. And when hemoglobin gets to skeletal muscle, right, you can see this one's carrying oxygen. When it gets to skeletal muscle, it's going to drop that oxygen off at the skeletal muscle. And that oxygen is going to diffuse into the muscle. It's just, I'm just showing you oxygen molecules. And it's going to bind to myoglobin. And what myoglobin is going to do is if we have our little happy myoglobin here, right? I'm just going to write it as an M. And it has all this oxygen bound to it. It's going to carry that oxygen to the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is going to say, hey, thanks. With that oxygen, I can now make energy, which is ATP. And that ATP will go to the muscles that are contracting and use it to contract longer. <clears throat> so that's all myoglobin is. It just transfers the oxygen from the bloodstream to the muscle tissue and brings it to the mitochondria. Now, when I talk about ATPase, I'm just talking about this machine inside of the mitochondria that will make ATP. Okay, very simple. I have the mitochondria. Okay, if oxygen and fatty acids, or we'll just say fat, get to the mitochondria, well, then this machine right here, which is called ATPase, it will spit out ATP. And all this means ATPase, ACE just means that it is an enzyme. So anytime you see the, the um, suffix ACE, that means it's an enzyme and it's making a reaction happen. Okay, so if I were to ask you on a test, what is the machine inside of the mitochondria that actually makes ATP, you would say, oh, that's ATPase. And we know that that's an enzyme. And if this doesn't make sense, I have this picture here for you where I just say kind of myoglobin is just this backpack and we fill that backpack with oxygen that is coming from the blood vessels and from the lungs. And then once that oxygen is filled inside of that backpack, that backpack goes to the mitochondria and it makes ATP. And again, we know that type 1 muscle fibers are aerobic. They're oxidative. They love oxygen. So they are aerobic fibers and they have a lot of this mitochondria. And it makes sense if they have a lot of mitochondria, they're going to have a lot of myoglobin. And if they have a lot of myoglobin, they're going to have a lot of ATPase. Okay? 
um, because they'll produce energy, which is ATP, aerobically. And when we say something is aerobically, we are saying that that reaction or that process needs oxygen. So when I say aerobic, it means oxygen. When I say anaerobic, I say there is no oxygen. Okay. Um, and if we, and I, I mentioned this in class as well, but let's talk about it. If you think about specific animals and how they move and how their muscles contract, and we look at uh, a fish uh, fillet here. Well, that fish has very little myoglobin because myoglobin is what gives muscle that red color. And we already talked about that on this previous, let me find that previous slide. We already talked about this on, oh, that's not what I'm looking for. We talked about that on this previous slide where I said the darker uh, muscle fibers are fibers that are filled with myoglobin, right? And the lighter ones are the ones that have less myoglobin. Well, if we look at this picture here, we could say, okay, well, that, that fish fillet is practically white, which means it's almost absent of myoglobin. Uh, and that can be because, well, the, of course, that creature lives underwater, so it has a different, it has a different uh, physiology. But also, if you think about how quick fish move, right? Um, for the most part, they're moving pretty quickly throughout their day, which means that they are not using a tremendous amount of uh, aerobic muscle fibers. And if we look here at these chicken breasts, well, we know that a chicken breast is connected with chicken wings, and we know when chickens flap their wings, um, they're very quick twitch muscle fibers, right? Of course, a chicken can't fly, um, but when a chicken does flap its wings, it's a very, very quick contraction. So therefore, because that contraction is quick, those are probably type 2X and some type 2A fibers, right? They're different muscle fibers. But if we look at beef here and we think about what a cow does, well, a cow doesn't have uh, quick twitch fibers. When you see a cow, it's usually lumbering and moving very slowly, and a cow can't really sprint. So therefore, we can assume that a cow has a lot of type 1 fibers, which means that that cow has a lot of myoglobin, right? Check has a lot of mitochondria, check, probably makes a lot of ATP aerobically, and it's, it's a cow is really just good for walking, right? You don't see a cow sprinting too often. You don't see a cow jumping in the air too often. Uh, so we can tell its muscle composition by what it does. Um, and this is just an analogy for ATPase. I told you just to look at it and think about a machine that just produces uh, energy. It just produces ATP, and that energy is being produced in the mitochondria. Um, and I have this picture here just to kind of show you that ATP is uh, it's usable and drainable, right? So after we eat food, our ATP levels can be very high. But as we exercise, those levels will become depleted because the skeletal muscle is going to use that ATP to exercise, right? So um, prior to exercising, if we feed ourselves the right way, we'll be able to power that flashlight, which is, I'm just saying that flashlight is like skeletal muscle. But as we exercise for longer durations of time, we deplete that battery, which means that we deplete the light or we deplete our ability to exercise. Um, so we have to constantly try to refill ATP, right? We have to constantly try to resynthesize it while we're exercising and throughout the day in order to have um, in order to have energy to exercise, right? And this ATPase, this is the machine that is going to be resynthesizing that and kind of recharging those batteries. So I just wanted to give you that analogy that just says that, well, ATP is not continuous. We're constantly using it. When we exercise, we use it even more. And then when we stop exercising, we have to regenerate it. And that's what the mitochondria does. It's going to regenerate that ATP. So it's going to take um, used ATP, which we call ADP, it's going to take that ADP 
it's going to go into the mitochondria and that ATP synthase is going to remake ATP. And this is bioenergetics and we'll get into this on Monday, but right now just kind of say, okay, this depleted battery is what Dr. B is calling ADP. And that stands for adenosine diphosphate and di just means two, right? And we don't want adenosine diphosphate because that is low energy. What we want is high energy, which is ATP, and that's adenosine triphosphate. Um, so tri means three. And this ATP synthase is this machine inside of the mitochondria that takes the, that takes the low battery and makes a uh, recharged, uh, much more energetic battery. So just kind of giving you a little taste of what we're going to do before we get into bioenergetics. And again, I'm just showing you here that these muscle fibers, uh, you can see some type one fibers here. And again, they're darker in color. They're smaller in diameter, right? So look at this big beefy one right here compared to the type one fiber. This is much bigger. Um, this one here is much bigger and it's lighter in color. So we know that could be a type two a or type 2X fiber, probably a type 2A. Um, but I'm just kind of showing you how those muscle fibers look under a microscope. And you can see the um, endomesium right here kind of surrounding these muscle fibers. All right, so just giving you an idea of what that looks like. So now when we talk about these type 2 fibers, all I need you to know is that these fibers twitch faster. All right, so if you think of the difference between a cow who just kind of walks and lumbers, right? Very lazy movement. And think about a hummingbird who flaps its wings incredibly fast its entire life. Well, those are the difference between type one slow twitch fibers and type two fast twitch fibers, all right? So type two, whether we're, oops, I lost it. Let me go back here. Oh, we were doing pretty good for a while there. Um, type two fibers, uh, like I said, we have type two a, which are strength fibers, and type 2X, which are power fibers. And if you don't know the difference between those contractions, we will talk about them. We will talk about, um, I'll show you some videos. I already showed you one in class. I'll show you some more, which kind of shows you the difference between those fibers. So a type 2A is the is the primary muscle fiber we use when we strength trade, train. Whenever you put some type of heavy load on the body and the body has to overcome that load by pushing it, those are generally type two fibers. Now type two X fibers are fibers that are powerful. So if you think of a sprinter that is running as fast as they can down uh, a football field, or you think of a basketball player that is jumping in the air to rebound and jumping to slam dunk, well, that's a very different contraction than laying on a bench and bench pressing. So power incorporates speed of movement where strength doesn't incorporate speed of movement. So um, these fibers, they have more fibers per motor unit. So if you think about that picture I showed you before where it showed the, the type one fibers that only had three fibers for one neuron, these are gonna have way more fibers per one neuron because they require greater tension, right? If you run and you're just carrying your body weight, that requires less muscle tension than if you put 250 pounds on a bar and you try to bench press it. So because it requires more tension, we have to recruit more muscle fibers. So we have greater recruitment, which means we activate more fibers during a contraction. Uh, they're bigger in diameter, I told you that already. These have a lower capacity for oxygen. And what I mean by that is the type 2A fibers they have some mitochondria, okay? Not as much as type one, so here's my mitochondria, but they have some. Type two X fibers, these don't have many mitochondria at all because they don't use oxygen. Type two A fibers can use oxygen, which means they're gonna have some mitochondria. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to this picture, oh, not that one. Let's go back to uh, this picture right here. So if I went to uh, the food again, well, you can see that this one is white, right? These are probably predominantly type 2X fibers, which means they don't have much mitochondria, 
which means that's a mitochondria. I'm drawing a line through it like the Ghostbusters, which means they don't have much myoglobin, which is why that tissue is white, right? So the cells, the muscle cells that we use for sprinting and for jumping and the ones that are really explosive, they don't have much mitochondria. They don't have much myoglobin. They, they use a different type of fuel. Now, if you look here, you can see that this is slightly pinker, right? So these would be an example of type 2A fibers that have some mitochondria and some myoglobin. They have way more than the type 2X, right? So I'm just going to say type 2X, type 2A. Um, they have some myoglobin, which is why they're pink, but it's nowhere near as much as the type 1 fibers that you see here, which have a lot of mitochondria and a lot of that myoglobin, and that means they like a lot of oxygen, right? So there's a spectrum here. <clears throat> the type 2X fibers, they don't really use oxygen. So I'm going to draw the Ghostbuster sign, right? There's no oxygen. Type 2A fibers, they use some oxygen. And the type 1 fibers, they use a tremendous amount of oxygen, okay? So I'm just, just kind of making sure you understand the difference between uh, these fibers. So... Uh, they have a lower capacity for oxygen. Type 2X has a lower capacity than type 2A, okay? So if I drew down here, I would say type 2A has a higher capacity, greater capacity than 2X for oxygen. I hope that makes sense. Just to reiterate, when we talk about the metabolism of these fibers, which just means what kind of energy do they use, right? What fuel do they use? Uh, I told you they have fewer mitochondria, they have fewer myoglobin, and they are quick to make ATP. Um, and this is something we'll talk about in bioenergetics. So, so for now, just don't even worry about that. I'm just going to kind of cross that out. Um, and they also have higher intramuscular stores of that ATP. So again, think about that swimming pool. I showed you that picture on that last one. Uh, on that last slide when we talked about 2A fibers, these, I'm sorry, type 1 fibers, these hold more of that ATP inside of them. So these fibers have more of that readily available energy. And like I said, if you think about that terrifying dog and you think about you have to sprint to get away, these muscle fibers are going to have more of that ATP energy so that you can produce more force to run faster to get away from that these are going to produce more energy because you have more of this ATP ready to go and save you from that horrific, terrifying dog. All right, so when we're talking about the motor units here, as I said before, these fibers, they have uh, one neuron innervates more fiber, which is why we can, we can produce more of that force that we need. So if we look at, um, let's just draw the picture again. If we look at, let's pick a color here. Oh, the pen is starting to die. Here we go. So if we, let's go green. If we look at the brain, and then we have the central nervous system, and then we have the peripheral nervous system, this one peripheral neuron will innervate one, two, three, four, and five. And that really didn't show up that well. So let me let me fix those neurons. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. So with the type two fibers. We'll, we'll just say these are type 2A and type 2X. Let's just keep it very simple. These motor units have more fibers for one neuron, right? If you look over here, I'm just trying to keep this as simple as possible. This is one neuron coming from the central nervous system, one motor neuron, and it's innervating five muscle fibers so we can produce more force because if I have five fibers contracting at the same time, I will generate more force, which is when I'm weightlifting, I need to generate more force, right? I have five fibers, five, four, three, two, 
1. And if you remember on the type 1 muscle fibers, I only had three fibers contracting for one motor, un um, one motor unit. So I have five neuromuscular junctions, right? And we know that a neuromuscular junction is where a neuron communicates with a muscle fiber and the place that they communicate is what we call the junction. So these produce more force because they contract more muscle fibers with a single neuron, all right? So that's why these are strength and more powerful fibers. Okay, so we have established a couple of things so far. And what we have established is just generically, we have three types of muscle fibers. We have type 1, type 2A, and type 2X. And we know that this one is aerobic. Uh, it likes oxygen, has a lot of mitochondria. This one can be anaerobic or aerobic. And that just means that we can operate with or without oxygen. This one likes a lot of glucose. And we know that this one is purely anaerobic and it likes to use ATP and something called phosphocreatine, which we'll talk about in bioenergetics. And we know that this one is good for running. I'm just going to put an R. This one is good for strength training. Put an S. This one is good for power. And you can see side by side that we all kind of have a genetic makeup with skeletal muscle, right? So uh, this is just a muscle biopsy that was conducted. And we can see that there's a lot of type 2A fibers and a lot of type uh, one fibers. We can see a couple of two X's here, two X, two X, two X, right? This could be a two X as well. So I'm just kind of showing you how within a single muscle group, we have multiple fiber types. Um, and again, when we exercise, we can kind of alter these muscle fiber types. We can change uh, how they respond and how they act. Uh, this is just kind of another picture to show you uh, when we stain muscle fiber, you can see that we can uh, have them be different colors. Uh, here you see type 2A is in green, right? You guys see that. Type 1 is in purple, and then type 2X is in yellow. So this, this muscle sample here looks like they are predominantly 2A. So this might be a strength athlete because they just simply have more 2A fibers. Um, and then this here, if you look at the blue, this is showing all the nuclei. And you can see that uh, we, we talked about how skeletal muscle is multinucleated. Let me see if I can pick a color here to get it to show up. So we can see here and here and here and here and here and here, uh, all these nuclei, right? So just nuclei are uh, surrounding all of these muscle fibers, right? And you can you can see that where I highlighted it. And if that's not showing up, um, let's do let's do red, right? So here, 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 right? You can see all of these dark blue circles, which are representing uh, the nuclei. So again, just beating a dead horse. Just kind of wanted to show you how these muscle fibers look. And this is inside of a single fascicle, right? So when we when we look into a muscle fascicle, they contain multiple fibers. And not only are these, uh, there are multiple fibers, but there's multiple, multiple fiber types. Um, now, if you were thinking about, well, what should I know for a quiz? This would be kind of what you should look at for a quiz or an exam. I'm just basically showing you what the functional differences are between type 2 fast fibers and of course these type 2 fast fibers they contain type 2a and 2x right this one is strength this one is power power is a much faster movement than strength i'll show you some videos on that in a bit uh, and then this is type 1 fibers and you can see that they are slow to reach peak force they have low peak force they don't produce a lot of force um, they are fatigue resistant. So what does that mean? Well, that means that these are endurance fibers and they take a long, long time to fatigue. It takes a long time for them to get tired. Unlike these type 2 fibers, these fatigue easily and these are more short-term duration. 
uh, muscle fibers. So just really look over this slide and just understand what the basic differences are and we are going to move on. So what I'm showing you here is the force production. And what does that mean? Well, that means how much force can these fibers produce? So if you think about somebody that runs and jumps to try to slam dunk a basketball inside of a basketball hoop, well, that's a lot of force. It takes a lot of force for someone to sprint and to jump. And when they're sprinting and they're jumping, they're using primarily these type 2A fibers and these type 2X fibers. That's what's making them get off the ground and get into the air. Where if we have somebody that's just jogging down the street, they're using primarily these type 1 fibers. And look at, they don't produce nearly as, enough, uh, as much force as type 2A and type 2X. They're pretty low, right? So these are, these are pretty low force production or producing muscle fibers, right? Um, and this is just kind of showing you the same thing over here. But what I'm showing you here is one of the things that determines the amount of force being produced are the myosin heads. Um, this class is way too uh, simple or, or, or uh, rudimentary to go into what these myosin heads do. But the, the way the myosin heads bind to actin, we have different types of myosin chains. Here we can see myosin heavy chain, myosin heavy chain 2A, myosin heavy chain 2A. Um, the way the myosin binds to actin is what produces that force, right? So here we can see type 1, type 2A, and type 2X. And if we look at power, right, how much power do these things produce? Well, type 2X produces the most power, type 2A produces the second, and type 1 produces very little power. So this is essentially the exact same thing as this. Um, you know, please read this. because if I said on an exam, hey, what is a slow twitch fiber? You better know that a slow twitch fiber is the equivalent to a type 1 fiber. And if I said, what is a fast twitch fiber? You would say, oh, well, that's a 2X or 2A. Um, so 2A and 2X are fast twitch And type 1 is slow twitch. Okay, so this graph is just showing you how much force they produce, right? And one of the other things this graph shows, let me clear this off. Let me, one of the other things this graph shows is how quickly they fatigue, right? So if we were to look at, let's look at this uh, figure to the right here. And um, let me highlight it. Let, let's follow my line here. So if I'm talking about 2x, it produces a lot of force. This right here is what we call peak force. Oh, let me switch that. That's illegible, illegible. This is called right here peak force. And this just means this is the highest force it can produce. And then look at how quickly it plummets. So these fatigue very quickly. They produce a lot of peak force, but then they fatigue fast. Now, if we look at the blue one here, let's follow my line here, right? So it, blue produces a lot of force. Here would be peak force. Okay, so I'll just put a big circle right there. And then this plummets, but it's a little slower. Um, its force production when it declines is a little slower than type 2X, that, that declines really fast. And then if we look at type one, let's switch it to red here. Type one, look at this, that's its peak force right there. It doesn't produce a lot of force compared to what 2X does. But if you look at how it fatigues, it's a very slow burn. It takes a lot for these fibers to fatigue. So again, type 2X produces a lot of force fatigues very quickly. Type 2A produces a lot of force, fatigues very quickly. Type 1 produces little force, and it doesn't fatigue very quick. It takes a long time for that uh, to, to fatigue. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, so here are the videos that I wanted to show you in class. So let me load these up now, and we can see the difference in uh, these 
force productions or how these things produce force. So give me one second and then hopefully you'll see the difference between type 2A, type 2X, and type 1 muscle fibers. Okay, so in class I started to show you this video and I had a lot of uh, issues with the technology. So I'm just going to show it to you again and um, just think about what I had told you about uh, type 2X fibers and training athletes to really develop that peace, peak force power. Uh, this is one of my uh, UFC fighters that I train. Uh, his name is Louis Kosi. Uh, he and his twin brother both got into the UFC on the same night uh, on Dana White's contender. So we made history that night uh, where two brothers got a UFC contract on the same night. Uh, and I just want you to watch how quickly um, he can move and contract his muscles in a way where they're producing a lot of force. And what I mean by producing a lot of force is these are quick twitch muscle fibers that when he touches the pad or he touches his opponent, there's so much force behind it that uh, he's putting he's putting athletes down in a single punch. So watch, boom, quick, quick twitch fiber, quick twitch fiber, quick twitch. Now he's using strength fibers back to quick twitch. He'll lift this guy up, strength fibers, and then he'll finish with a hook here. He'll have a quick twitch. Um, Boom, put him down, and then look at how fast he is firing uh, his punches. Uh, that was the night he won his UFC contract, and just kind of notice the power he's developing, right? So we have to train these athletes in a certain way to produce that type of power. So if we did a muscle biopsy on him, we would see that he is primarily a 2X athlete, uh, where if he touches you, uh, down you go. So if we look at this athlete, uh, we are going to see a much different type of contraction. Uh, we're going to see an individual that is going to lift a tremendous amount of weight and he's going to produce peak force, but it's not going to be as much force as uh, what we saw in the MMA athlete where uh, they were producing power. This is going to be primarily strength. So let's take a look at how this contraction looks compared to what we saw with the fighter. Uh, and you can see the completely different body types, right? So strength athletes generally have a bit more size to them and they also have a bit more adipose tissue or fat because of the metabolism of the strength fibers. Uh, they're not going to burn a tremendous amount of fat so they'll carry it with them um, as athletes. Now take a look at this contraction here. This is uh, like almost as much weight as a Buick. Uh, and much, much slower contraction. So he's still producing a lot of force, but you see how the contraction is slower. And if you think about the motor units, and now he's about to pass out. Uh, if you think about the motor units that are being recruited, there are a lot more motor units and muscle fibers that are being recruited than what we would see with type one fibers. And then lastly, what we're going to see here is type one recruitment and we're going to see a completely different type of muscle activation. So again, this is a slower contraction. It's lower force. You can see there's not a lot of fat on this individual and mostly because, you know, people who run are metabolizing fat. So therefore they don't carry it on their body. And um, she's recruiting much uh, fewer um, motor units. Now what I wanted to show you here is when she picks up the pace, so you notice that before she was running slower, that's primarily type 1 fibers. But now when she picks up the pace and she's moving quicker, now she's recruiting type 1 fibers and type 2 A, A fibers to help increase that speed. So it's tricky, but you can see that um, we have three different fiber contraction types and um, this gives us the, the ability to move uh, in very specific ways, especially during sports and uh, athletics. Okay, so on the next two slides, I'm just beating the dead horse and I'm showing you the difference between these fast and slow twitch fibers. And again, we're talking about slow twitch, which are type 1 fibers, and fast twitch, which are type 2A and type 2X. Type 2X would be that fighter, right? I showed you the fighter. And then type 2A would be that uh, weightlifter, right? G-H-T, the weightlifter. And this is another important um, 
slide for a quiz perhaps. So if you want to look at this picture, this really characterizes all of the information you need to know about these fibers. So I'd really spend some time on this. Contraction time, okay, slow contraction, fast contraction, very fast contraction. I just showed you that with the video. Oxidative capacity, what does that mean? Well, that means they like to use oxygen. So we can see type 1 loves to use oxygen. Type 2A can use oxygen uh, because they have more mitochondria. And type 2X can't use very much oxygen at all. Then diameter, right? Small, medium, large. It makes sense that the type 2X are the larger ones because they can produce so much more force. Uh, resistance to fatigue, I already talked about that. Type 1 fibers, they have a very high resistance, which means they don't fatigue very quickly. Type 2A fibers are moderate, and type 2X fibers, they resist or, I'm sorry, they um, have poor resistance to fatigue. And what does that mean? That means they get tired fast. You can't use them for long periods of time. And again, this is the force. We talked about basketball players, runners, and fighters. And you can see that they have different force production. And this is very much the same thing. So if you're sitting down and doing homework all day, you're primarily using type 1 fibers. If you're doing a lot of strength training, you're primarily using type 2 fibers, right? And these other fibers, you can see that these arrows go down, right? So type when you're sitting at your desk and you're just kind of doing some work, type 1 fibers go up and type 2 fibers go down. You don't really need to recruit a lot of muscle or strength fibers in order to do that work at the office or at, or at um, your desk at school. Now, the same thing's true if I'm doing resistant training. I have an increase in type 2 fibers and a decrease in type 1 fibers because I told you strength training is primarily type 2A fibers. Now, if I'm doing a lot of power training, you can see that type 2A fibers are up, type 1 fibers are down, and if I'm doing a lot of running, well, we know type 1 fibers are going to be up and type 2 fibers are going to be down. So, um, Unfortunately, this athlete would use a lot of 2X fibers too because they're throwing weight at a very quick pace. But this is just to show you, this kind of just reiterates what I told you here and what I showed you here. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, so if I asked you on a quiz, hint, hint, wink, wink, um, what fibers would a runner primarily use? You should be able to go to this picture look at the runner and say, okay, well, that arrow is going up right there. So that means that they're using more type 1 fibers, and this arrow is going down. So they're using less type 1, like less type 2 fibers. Same thing here. Type 1 fibers are down. Type 2 fibers are up. Don't worry about hybrid fibers. We're not going to talk about that in this class. This is a introduction to kinesiology and uh, exercise science. Uh, if I look at resistance training, well, I told you type 2 fibers go up, type 1 fibers go down. And if we're just sitting at a desk, type 1 fibers go up, type 2 fibers go down. And again, don't worry. Don't worry about hybrid. You will be asked this on your exam. Um, so please pay attention to that. Um, and this picture here is just trying to show you what athletes use which fibers. So we can see here that we have slow twitch fibers, and we see here in blue we have fast twitch fibers, okay? Or we have 2A, 2X, and type 1. So if somebody is a marathon runner, you can see that they are primarily using, I'm going to highlight for you, they are primarily using this type 1 fiber, right? Because they're endurance athletes. Same thing with this one here. If we have an endurance runner, they are using primarily type 1 fibers. If we go in the middle and we look at a swimmer right here, well, a swimmer is about 50-50. And why is a swimmer 50-50? Because the water in the pool is creating resistance, and that resistance is going to cause a greater recruitment of type 2 fibers. Oops. So a swimmer is 50% type 1, 50% type 2. And it's because of the water. The water is going to create resistance. And because there is resistance, you have to activate type 2 muscle fibers. 
And if we look at a sprinter, someone way over here on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, well, this is somebody that runs a very quick pace for a very short distance. And they're almost primarily type 2 fibers. So what you should notice on this is that we never, ever use just one type of fiber. We are always using a, let me, why isn't this working? Get back to this. We are always using a ratio of 1, 2A, and 2X. Over here, for a marathon runner, that ratio is primarily type 1 and a little bit of type 2. But if we come down here and we look at a sprinter, the ratio is primarily type 2 and just a little bit of type 1. So we're always activating the fibers. We're just doing it in different ratios depending upon the activity. Now, what this picture is showing you is how we recruit muscle fibers. And this is kind of going back to what I just told you about that ratio, right? So we are always going to recruit the smaller muscle fibers first. And if you remember, I went back to those earlier back in that slide, I told you that type one is the smallest in diameter. So we'll say this is one. Type 2A is moderate in diameter, and type 2X is the largest, right? So we are always going to recruit smallest and slowest first. So recruiting the smaller and the slowest, we know that 1 is the smallest, and it is also the slowest, right? And if we went back to these slides and we looked at, well, what are you talking about, smallest and slowest? Well, when we went back to this one here, I showed you that these muscle fibers have the smallest diameter, right? Compared to something like this, which is certainly a type 2X. Look how big this fiber is compared to this little, little baby fiber right here, right? And then, so we know that we go from small to medium to large. So if we want to recruit 2X fibers, oh, why is it doing that? If we want to recruit 2X fibers, we first got to recruit type 1, move to type 2A, and then we can get at the 2X. Um, and then if I showed you this slide again, right, we talked about the slowest. We recruit the slowest, which I showed you type 1 here to the moderate type 2A to the fastest type 2X. So what this picture is showing you is that we go from small fibers, look how small that one is, to bigger, to bigger, to moderate, to large fibers. That's how we recruit them. So if we need to recruit a type X fiber, think about that video I just showed you of the basketball player, right? Jumping and slam dunking. In order for those fibers to be activated, we have to activate 1 and 2A first. So 1 and 2A are supporting the activity of type 2X. Um, so just keep that in mind, that we always recruit from small to moderate. Why is it doing that? I don't know what the heck that is. Let me just let me do this. Small. What is that? I don't know what it's doing. I'm just so tired of technology. But it, again, we go from small. Let me highlight it. Let's see if it does it here. We go from small, type 1, to moderate, type 2, to forceful, type 2X. That's how we recruit it. All right? So if I asked you on a quiz, if I want to jump and sprint, what muscle fibers do I have to activate first? Well, I already told you that jumping and sprinting has to do with um, uh, type 2X fibers. And here I'm telling you, in order to get at those type 2X fibers, we, we have to recruit and activate the other ones first. Um, and here I just have, a, a, you can read this on your own. It talks about order of recruitment. And um, it's just, I'm just saying that it's, again, this is an, an analogy, right? So look at that. I'm just telling you essentially um, how we recruit these muscle fibers, and I do it in an analogy. Um, I am going to skip 
this slide. You do not have to worry about it. You do not have to worry about this one. We just don't have the time, nor do you have to worry about this one. Um, but we do have to talk about this one, and I do believe this is our um, last slide. So when we recruit these fibers, especially during exercise, uh, we cause trauma to the fibers. We injure them, and that injury is necessary to have adaptations which is going to make an athlete bigger, better, faster, and stronger. So in order to grow as an athlete, uh, or just if you're a fair weather uh, exerciser and you just want to go into the gym and just look better, um, we have to damage uh, some of this tissue. So what I'm going to explain to you here is something called DOMS, okay? And this stands for Delayed Onset Muscle Soreness. And essentially what DOMS is, is it, this means that 48 to 72 hours after we exercise, we are going to experience something called uh, DOMS, which is basically soreness of the muscles. So if, you're, if you worked out pretty heavy, you're like, oh man, this my legs are sore today. I did leg day the other day. This is caused by inflammation of the muscle because the damage that we do to those muscle fibers causes the res repair response, which is inflammation, to kind of come and help make muscle repair. And while we're repairing, we're going to rebuild that muscle that we've damaged. So this is how uh, athletes get bigger. That's how they increase in muscle. That's how they get more metabolic. Um, so this occurs anywhere from two to three days and it is part of the recovery process. So what do I mean by micro trauma? Um, this one here is just an analogy telling you what DOMS is. So you can read that if you don't understand it. Okay. Um, this is my, my lay analogy for you guys. But what I wanted to show you here is what happens to the skeletal muscle when we're experiencing this soreness. So what you see here is a healthy muscle we see the different fascicles right there's a fascicle here there's a fascicle here we can see a fascicle here and inside there we see the muscle fibers well when we exercise and we damage those fibers this is what happens to them so take a look at the difference you can see that how when they were really organized here right everything's in this nice kind of clean compartmentalized sort of um organization when we go here, we kind of lose that, right? This looks a little more like steak than it does uh, anything else, right? Um, and after 27 hours or 24 hours, we can see that we start releasing these things called satellite cells, which you don't really need to know what they are. The inflammation process starts and we start to repair and rebuild. So what we saw here is completely absent here because we're rebuilding the tissue. And then after 72 hours, you could see the tissue kind of resembles what it did uh, three days ago. And this is the DOMS process. This is the process that it, it happens to make the muscle bigger and stronger and faster. And I have some other pictures here that show what it looks like before and after. You can see the muscle damage here is uh, it's completely disorganized compared to what we see in normal striated skeletal muscle. And likewise, the same thing here. Um, we can see some sarcoplasmic reticulum. We can see some T-tubules. We can see that M-line, right? So this would be the sarcomere. Um, we can see some endomesium here. But then when we strength train, you can see that that is completely unorganized. It's chaos because exercise damages the fibers and then we have to rebuild those fibers so that what we began with like this we end with and that takes about 72 hours so when somebody is sore after exercising it is a completely natural thing and that is how we create athletes that is it take care i'll see you guys in class